Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second in our three-part series of webinars where we're exploring exit options. Uh, today's webinar will be covering management buyouts and employee ownership trusts. Two weeks ago, we had our first webinar on trade sales, and a recording of that is available on request. And in two weeks' time, we have our third and final webinar on private equity or selling to private equity on the 17th of October. Um, my name is Matt Wilmot. I'm a director in the corporate finance team at, here at PK Francis Clark. Um, I specialize in company sales, acquisitions, management buyouts, and employee ownership trusts. I'm going to be the host of today's webinar, supported by my expert colleagues who will introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, before that, I'd just like to give a bit of a background as to why we thought it was important to hold these series of webinars. Now, for any business owner who's contemplating an exit or looking to realize value from their business, it's really important for them to understand their priorities, both at a personal and a business level. Now, as well as that, it's all equally important for them to understand which options are available to them in their circumstances and which of those options best meet those priorities. In our experience, business owners who are well prepared have a good understanding of the processes, both the pros and the cons, will enter that with a better frame of mind and they'll make better decisions from the outset, leading to ultimately a better outcome for all involved. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel. So um, could we go around one at a time, starting with Isaac, please? Thanks, Matt. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name's Isaac Moore and I work in the M&A team here at PCare Francis Clark. Uh, so like Matt, I specialise in supporting stakeholders in, in undertaking transactions, uh, so that might include a trade sale, uh, management buyouts, uh, acting for either the vendors or for the management team, um, as well as employee ownership trusts. Thanks, Isaac. And uh, Nicola? Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. I'm a tax partner here at Francis Clark, and I specialise in transactions as well, so including management buyouts and employee ownership trusts. Thanks, Nicola. And Alison? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alison Trant. I'm a director in the corporate finance team, specifically um, on the debt advisory side of things. So I'm a banker by background and I work alongside my corporate finance and tax colleagues, um, understanding what role debt can play in any sort of transaction. Thanks, Alison. OK, so um, in terms of kicking off, let's let's start with the basics in terms of you know, what are we talking about here from both the management bio and possibly new to some some of the uh, the people attending might be what is an employee ownership trust? So, um, Isaac, do you want to kick us off in terms of you know what is a management buyout? What are the key features? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Matt. So a management buyout or uh, MBO, as we'll probably refer to it as throughout the course of the webinar, uh, is the sale of a business to some or all of its management team. Um, so this could be a sale of 100% of the shares in the business or just a sale of part of it. Um, so it represents an attractive proposition for management as they can become uh, owners of a business and potentially sort of create transformative wealth. Um, and this is because they can, they can obtain funding to purchase the business and then ultimately repay that funding out of the future profits that the business generates. From a vendor's perspective, um, it's quite a flexible transaction. Uh, so it could be sort of selling 100% of the shares or, or potentially uh, retaining a smaller equity stake, um, sort of subject to tax advice, which, which Nicola will come on to later. Um, there's, you know, you're selling to your management team who, who you know and trust. So vendors quite like that from an ongoing legacy point of view. I do think it's important to highlight that um, there are some potential risks associated with this on the basis that, um, you know, if you were having negotiations with, with an external buyer, for example, and those were to break down, um, you know, the business will probably continue as normal. Um, whereas if you're negotiating with a management team um, and those negotiations fall away, you know, the management need to continue to run the business. So there's a risk associated with that in the background. Um, so that just highlights the importance of planning and preparation in this process and sort of handling the process delicately and, and seeking advice. Um, but overall, they're, they're sort of extremely popular transactions that, that we advise a lot on and, and offer a great opportunity for both management and vendors to, to achieve their objectives. Fantastic. And uh, employee ownership trusts or EOTs, Nico. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So an employee ownership trust is formed for the benefit of all the employees of the business. So to contrast with a management buyout where it could be certain members of the management team who 
take ownership of the of the, of the business, take it forward, so that the, the the trust is the buyer of the of the company, and it has to take a controlling stake in order to for various of the, the tax reliefs to apply. Um, and it's basically a form of employee benefit trust, um, but a specific type. Um, but it really is a, a particular kind of succession which hands over the business to um, benefit of the employees for the for the long term. So the idea is that you're really sort of handing over that business for the for the employees to run um, uh, and to be incentivized to, to to grow that business for their for their benefit as a whole. Um, so you do still need them. Um, a professional management team to to run the business but they're not usually incentivized in the same way as with an mbo and um, by the growth in the, in the value of the business as a whole um but but it is still key that um that you know, the, the business will need to be be run professionally for the future um there are certain key tax benefits of selling your business to employee ownership trust so and um, the headline being that the, the sellers um can benefit from a complete tax-free sale on the on the consideration that they receive um, and there are also certain tax-free bonuses that can be um, provided to employees once the, the trust is up and running for the future um, but generally the, the the taxes shouldn't be the key driver really it's the it's the succession for the um, employees and, and and that kind of employee owned ethos which is really really important um, it tends to suit sort of generally quite a steady growth businesses um, well in terms of that 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 benefit of the of the business for the employees going forward um so so yeah it's a it's a it's an interesting really different type of um uh, succession planning for your business which is becoming you know has become increasingly popular thanks Nicola. so i think it, it's probably fair to say <clears throat> whilst we've we've paired sort of management buyout and employee ownership together they are very different transactions from in terms of the, the process involved, but also ultimately the, the end objective, whether it's management team holding equity or whether it's a trust on behalf of all the employees. There's, there's quite a distinction there. Um, what I should have said at the outset is that if there are any questions that uh, anyone wants to ask, please feel free to put, pop it in the chat and we'll, um, we'll look to address them as we go or, or at the end, depending if we have time. Um, so I guess just just trying to drill into a little bit more of that the detail. Um, if a business owner was was contemplating um, a management buyout, I think Isaac, you, you've touched on some of the points there in your your initial introduction. But you know, what should they be considering um, when they're they're contemplating an MBO? And um, I guess how does it perhaps differentiate to a trade sale, for example? Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. So I think sort of following on from one of the points I made in my introduction is vendors can often be attracted to a management buyout as a transaction route because of um, the sort of ongoing legacy and business continuity piece. Um, ultimately, the vendors know the management well, management operate and run the business. The staff know them. They likely hold a lot of the key customer and key supplier relationships already. Um, so there's not a significant sort of change necessarily required. Some of the risk associated with a trade sale from a vendor's perspective can be uncertainty over what the new owner might do with the business post transaction. Um, and they may take the view that so that as they know management, there's less uncertainty around that. I think it is important to highlight that a trade buyer can have the sort of potential to deliver synergies. So if you're selling to a competitor, who is part of a larger group, for example, and they might be able to come in and undertake sort of cost saving synergies or have cross selling opportunities within the group. And as a result of this, you know, they may be willing to sort of pay a premium value because of that. Um, this isn't always the case and, and management, you know, they, they don't have the opportunity to deliver these synergies. They've got to put in place their, their business growth plan. Um, and value isn't always the, the sort of only consideration for vendors. It's it's a key one, um, but there are much sort of there are a range of wider factors that vendors consider, like sort of bringing management into the ownership, that ongoing continuity piece, and also the flexibility that these structures can provide. So I think it's probably useful to give a bit of an example um, of a transaction that we've gone through from a management buyout perspective. So um, a client of ours, uh, they were two 50-50 shareholders in the business, um, and they decided that 
you know, they wanted to think about the sort of ongoing um, business succession piece. They weren't ready to exit the business, um, but they recognized that the management team were extremely important to driving future growth. So what they decided to do was reduce their shareholding down to 30% collectively uh, and bring their management team in as, as equity shareholders alongside them. You know, this had the, the output of enabling them to de-risk now because they took some cash off the table, uh, but most importantly, they aligned management with themselves so that any future growth that management uh, contributed towards delivering, um, they saw the benefit of that in, in a growth in their equity value. Um, so it's, it represented a phased approach and sort of moving forward, they may do a second transaction where they look to exit completely, um, but it's just important to highlight that these transactions can be flexible um, and sort of meet different objectives and be part of a wider sort of succession plan. I think another reason that, that vendors might consider these sorts of transactions um, as opposed to trade sales as well is, is around the fact that the buyer is there. It's someone you know and you trust that's sort of at your doorstep. Um, and this can have a few different uh, impacts really, because under a trade sale, you may be going out to a wide range of parties, which one can take time. Um, but secondly, and, and potentially most importantly, um, that results in there being a level of potentially confidential and sensitive information that's out there in the market. So this is mitigated through uh, confidentiality agreements, such as non-disclosure agreements. Um, but there's always a risk that the more confidentially informa information that's out there, sort of the bigger the risk. Um, so sometimes vendors may have concerns over that and sharing information with competitors. And an MBO process is more of a sort of internal transaction and, and can be attractive from that perspective. Thanks, Isaac. I think sort of key point coming out of that really is, is flexibility. You know, the beauty of a management buyout is an owner can exit completely if they want to. They can remain involved at an operational level. They can remain involved at a shareholder level. So there is truly a, a wide range of um, options available to them within that one structure. But, um, you know, ultimately having that management team is is key. So we just we had one question in, Isaac, on, on this subject. Um, I suppose when a, you know, a seller is looking to exit the business to a trade buyer, you know, that trade buyer may bring in a management team or they may be able to, to replace the owner quite quickly. I guess how critical is it from an MBO perspective in terms of that transition of responsibilities in preparation? Yeah, I think it's extremely important and it sort of varies from business to business. So, you know, we've had examples of clients where um, the shareholders are, are heavily involved in the day to day running of the business still. Um, and they do have a management team that are coming through, but, but the shareholders are still sort of doing making a lot of those decisions. And you've kind of got the opposite end of the spectrum where um, they may have already transitioned to management and started to you know, only attend monthly board meetings. So I think it's important to recognize that there's a process to go through for different businesses. And I guess part of the flexibility that an MBO offers is if there's a handover that's required um, there's potentially some more flexibility in, in that shareholder staying on on the basis that they are already in the business. You know, they know how it operates. That might be in a sort of non-exec or, or kind of chairman of the board role, for example. Um, there's potentially a bit more flexibility, whereas a trade buyer, dependent upon the level of management that they have ready to put in place, they might, they may sort of, yeah, they may not be as receptive to that. But again, it's, it's sort of fully dependent upon the buyer because you may have a trade buyer who, you know, they expect the business to continue and running on an as-is basis post deal so they would expect there to be a management in place ready to run that and that can impact the level of time that the vendors ultimately have to remain involved thanks isaac and i guess a sort of similar question to you nicola on um eot's you know the, the dynamic change when the management team are still in place but, but where does the owner sit in that in that sort of transition to employee ownership yeah, so um, the owners will usually want to, again, have some kind of succession with the management team. Again, it depends how um, integrated the management are already, how much how much work they're doing. Um, often with an, EO, with an EOT, um, there might be needed to be a bit more of a transition period um, because um, if you have a, a management team who are 
are really dynamic and running the business, you might find that an MBO would, would be a more suitable transaction. Um, so there may of, may often need to be a bit more of a transition period where you're bringing your management team along, and so the the, the vendors will often want to have a um, um, some say still, so be on the board of the company, um, and maybe also on the uh, as one of the trustees. Um, it's it's key that the vendors don't control the business anymore, but um, but to have some stake and influence going forward will usually help the business. Um, and also, there's often a or, well, almost always an amount of deferred consideration payable to the vendors over a period of time from the sale. Um, and so, having a bit of <coughs> influence and oversight helps to kind of protect that position as well. Um, but still, you do you do do really need your management team on board, and you need you need them to be. Um, you know, on board with the whole um, ethos of the employee ownership, and, um, and and that's really key. And so, to 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 help with that and assist with that, they would be you want to engage them at an early stage and work out a plan for that that transition to employee ownership with them. Thanks, Nicola. I think just touching on one of the points there around um, you know, deferred consideration. C clearly, for any vendor looking to realise value, getting some cash. Uh, day one is is probably quite important, and when they might see the, the the rest of the consideration if it isn't day one. Alison, could you give us a bit of an overview over, I guess, how these transactions might be be structured and funded? <clears throat> yeah, certainly. Um, one of the key points we wanted to to make today was there is a common misconception that in the case certainly of M MBOs that the management themselves personally need to raise the funds to to execute the transaction and so first and foremost that is not true um debt and indeed equity which will be covered in another uh, seminar um can play a very important and major role there is an expectation for management teams incoming management teams that they should have what's referred to as skin in the game um, a general rule of thumb is sort of six to 12 months of their annual salary as as a personal investment towards the transaction um, it's generally not um, a material way of making up the consideration, but it's more to represent their real commitment to the future performance of the business. So these things are senior debt um, will play a, usually a, a significant role in making up the consideration. So it'll be about striking a balance and see some personal contribution from the incoming management team, some senior debt, and then perhaps the remainder on deferred consideration. And the lender is looking for that, a sensible balance between their stake in the business, um, what importantly it can afford to pay without putting it under any undue pressure. And then importantly, um, that the, the, the seller is not just sort of immediately de-risking themselves from the situation and leaving the lender and the new management team um, with a heavy burden of debt to, to, to repay. So the point being, um, some contribution personally from incoming management team and then a balance to be found between the role that senior debt and the deferred consideration can play. Thanks Alison. So I think, um, I mean, if you, if you can picture sort of a scales on the one hand, on the left hand side, you've got the purchase price for the business and on the right hand side, you, you've got to fund it and it's going to come from a combination of, as, as I said, equity, debt, management contribution and deferred terms so that management contribution as, as Alison said is tends to be a pretty small proportion we have the management buyouts with no contribution um, but they are quite rare and particularly where there's funding involved um, the funders will, will tend to be backing a management team so they'll probably want um, a demonstration of that so that's the sort of skin in the game piece um, okay so just moving on to um, a shareholders thinking about weighing up an MBO versus an EOT. Um, now clearly they're, they're, they're very different sorts of transaction, but we quite often have clients who, who almost want to decide between the two. Um, Nicola, in terms of just sort of direct comparisons between them and some of the things that, that sort of shareholders might want to be aware of when they're trying to make a decision between the two, do you mind giving a bit of an overview of that? Of course. Um... So as I've said, one of the key things to bear in mind is that for an employee ownership trust, it's really a long-term succession plan 
um, to, to leave a legacy for your business for the, for the benefit of your employees as a whole. Um, so that's something to think about in terms of um, is that the kind of succession that you that you want for your business um, as opposed to the MBO where it's really more for the, the management team to um, hand the business over to you who will grow um, and, and then probably sell again in, in the future. Um, so one of the key things there is is both what kind of succession that you you want in legacy for your business but also the management team as well um, what is it that's um, going to be best for your business in terms of that that future growth and the legacy do you have an entrepreneurial management team who really want to be um, you know, take over that business and run it and grow it you can probably keep a, a stake then and potentially um, benefit from that future growth um, whereas with the neat with the OT um, the you would enter into that without a view to selling again in the future so it's a long-term succession plan is that going to be enough incentive for the management team who are going to be running the business for the future um, and is that um, um, suitable for you in terms of although you can keep a stake in the business there's no obvious way of them um, uh, realizing that that stake in in the future unlike with a with an MBO transaction so there's those sorts of things to consider um, there's also the governance as well so um, uh, in the management buyout you've got um, the, the, the the company and um, the business which are run like the private company that you have before so um, not too different in terms of the, the ongoing governance Whereas with an employee ownership trust, that's quite different. You have um, a trust who controls the business um, for the benefit of all the employees. Um, so there are things to think about there in terms of who are going to be um, the trustees, um, who is going to um, uh, uh, be on the board of the company as well. And there are sort of conflicts of interest there to, to manage. Um, it's often a good idea to appoint a trustee who's got particular experience of running employee ownership trusts um, because there are particular governance issues to think about. Um, it's obviously the tax difference which I've talked about as well, um, subject to any changes that we have coming up in the budget, but um, there are tax considerations to, to, to consider as, as vendors. Um, and then another thing is um, talked about the management team and incentivization. So, um, with an MBO, um, they've got their equity stake, so I'm really incentivized to grow grow the business. Um, it is possible to um, to incentivize the management team with equity alongside an employee ownership trust, but it is more difficult. Um, and because of there being no plan for a kind of second exit, um, it's it's difficult to see how there's no guarantee that that could be realised and at what value. And so again, that's something to think about in terms of what what's going to incentivise your your management team for the for the future of the business and what will work best from that point of view. Thanks, Nicole. I think I think what I'm hearing is you know it's really important to understand the dynamics of both the business and the management team, and and obviously the you know the culture needs to be right for it to be an employee ownership. I think it you know when we're talking about the success of of the business going forward, we've got on the one hand, a management team who are personally incentivized under a management buyout through growth of the value of their equity compared to a EOT where we've got management who may be incentivized through bonuses in other ways, but you've got an employee workforce who are all, I guess, emboldened because of their collective benefits yeah. potentially, which um, which which come under the EOT. Um, I suppose just is it worth touching on some of those benefits to the wider employees under an EOT um, as to you know what 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 can happen yeah so um, um, so often um, one or more of the employees could have um, a, a, a stake or interest in some of the decision making so potentially um, could have a employee council who could um, Make recommendations to the um, to the board or the trustee about how the, the company is run. So there's potential for kind of involving the employees a bit more in in the running of the business. Um, there are also um, potential for tax free bonuses to be um, paid by the by the company to employees um, up to 
3,600 3, a year per, per employee. Um, so um, um, there, there's, there's, there's a way of incentivizing them financially, but also, as you say, the ethos is that the, the benefit for the, for the employees as a whole, um, it, it, that, that's the nature of the employee ownership trust. It owns it for the employees. Um, so it's also possible that the business could be sold at a later date and all of the employees benefit from that um, sale as well. Um, but it's just usually it's it's more for the kind of long term succession and, and benefit of the, for the employees that are more engaged. And also there are these cash bonuses which they can use to incentivize them as well. Yeah, so I think there's a key differential there. Um, Clearly, management buyouts. There may be a subsequent transaction where the management team realise value. I think the majority of EOTs are are one way processes, albeit there have been some examples, not not a huge number yet, um, of of transactions where EOTs have been acquired. Um, okay, we've we've had a had a question, um, Alison. I don't know if you could you could address this one. So, the question is around. Um, regarding an MBO where um, there may be funding coming in from either a lender or private equity and um, they're, they're asking about whether the sort of outside investor would require sort of directors on the board or perhaps a broader question is what influence might they they have in the running of the business? Yeah I'll answer on behalf of um, if it was a, a debt provider as opposed to sort of equity provider and I'll come back to that but um, from a debt provider you're going to find yourself quite often for businesses this is it's a new important stakeholder in your business um, and quite often for businesses it's the most sort of sizable or more complex debt that they've ever undertaken um, so the, the lender is going to have a very much vested interest in the future performance of your business. Quite often the debt is what we recall uh, refer to as cash flow debt, i.e. it's done, and I'll go into it in a bit more detail later, as a multiple of EBITDA performance. What that means is they're going to require um, co continuous monitoring of the performance of the business. And if you've not had that type of debt before, that might feel a bit more invasive or certainly new. Um, so they're going to have requirements for ongoing detailed information packs um, to monitor the, the performance of the business. They won't have a, a necessarily um, a role and they won't have an active role on the board, but they might have, have had some views on the way in and deploying the debt around the skill set and the breadth um, and depth of knowledge on, on the board. So they will be, they would have done that on um, before or the deployment and their assessment of the lending proposal in terms of that skill but then thereafter they would leave the actual ongoing running of the business to the management of the business they will control their debt with covenants um, so and in the documentation the the loan documentation will have a number of um, controls that if performance isn't um, being delivered at the levels expected um, there it basically will bring the the lending back around the table um, and it depends on the extent to which performance is, um, is where, where what, what stage it's at if it's over if the business is overperforming, there could be an opportunity to accelerate some of the deferred consideration payments so it's not always necessarily a negative thing could be a positive discussion if it is underperforming perhaps they need to have a discussion about restructuring their debt etc so in answer to the question, they will have they will be a, an important stakeholder, but not an actual seat at the table. But their documentation will and give them sufficient controls to come and speak um, and request further information at any time. Thanks, Alison. I think from an equity perspective, we'll, we'll probably be covering more in the webinar in two weeks' time. But I think the the simple uh, answer is the majority of PE uh, investors will want to have a seat at the board they will want to have some input into decision making um, it does vary depending on who that investor is but uh, broadly speaking they will have some form of influence at board level um, we've had another question uh, on EOTs in terms of um, shareholdings Nicola so um, there's, there's sort of two questions here which I think are, are linked so the question is do all employees have an equal stake or is it weighted and what happens when employees leave in the future? Do they have to sell sell their share? So 
broadly all employees have an equal stake um, so there are certain criteria with which you can distinguish between them in terms of say the level of bonus which can be paid to them um, based on length of service for example um, but for very broadly all employees do have an equal stake um, so um, uh, that that's why for your management team, for example, it, you can't incentivize them via the EOT structure, but you can have a, a separate kind of commercial normal cash bonus scheme for them, for example. Um, and then in terms of if employees want to leave the company, um, they don't they they don't there's nothing they need to do in terms of selling anything because it's the trust which holds the shares on behalf of the employees. So if somebody leaves, then there's no transaction there for them to, to, to sell the shares. Um, it's the trust which holds the shares on behalf of those employees. Yeah, I think, I think that's sort of an important distinction between MBOs and EOTs. You know, the individual employees won't hold shares personally, that's held by a trust for the benefit of all, whereas a management buyout, the individual management team will hold shares personally. And if they leave, yes, they will likely want to transfer them on to others. And obviously, if new management join, they will then personally have to, to acquire those shares. Um, OK, so I guess move, moving on to looking at um, management buyouts. Now, um, we we tend to see a couple of different um, variations of management buyouts in terms of who controls the process. And Isaac, I don't know if you could talk us through vendor-led transactions versus management-led transactions? Uh, yeah, of course. So sort of the vendor or, or shareholder-led transaction is sort of what it says on the tin, ultimately, it's it's the shareholders driving that process. So you know, they will be going out and, and seeking professional advice, um, structuring the transaction, uh, potentially setting the value. They may be going to funders and, and having those initial conversations to ascertain funding appetite. Um, but they are the ones driving the process and they then subsequently bring the management team into that process um, sort of offering the opportunity to them um, i think this is quite common where a shareholder is looking to retain an equity stake um, like an example i spoke about earlier the flip side of this is a management-led or initiated process um, and this is where the management are much more proactive in uh, producing a business plan kind of presenting to the vendors kind of what they would like to achieve the management team are then the, the parties going out and pitching to the funders and getting them to invest in their business plan um, and they'll be looking to seek advice and structure the transaction so i think the key point here is that um, it doesn't really matter which which party is leading the process i think it can be led by either party is the key point um, but just the flag that yeah it could be shareholders themselves as as, as the owners already or, or management if you've got a particularly proactive management team interested in a transaction yes, i think i think important distinction is who's going to be running and leading the business post transaction um now certainly if you've got funders coming on board for a transaction you know ultimately they're backing the management team and therefore you know through that funding process they're going to be assessing management team's quality and if management are able to present their strategy and present their case, um, that's that's a much stronger proposal than perhaps the vendor saying, well, um, here's here's the deal I want to do and please back these people over here who you're not speaking to. So it's trying to get them engaged at the right level at the right time. OK, um, we've had a couple of questions that are very similar, um, actually, and it's around um, looking at a, a hybrid deal, so part EOT part MBO. Um, Nicola, I don't know if you could s briefly cover um, what that might look like and uh, the complexities it, it may may provide. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so in theory, that is possible where you have um, the, the trust, the EOT, which owns and controls um, the company. Um, but with a management team who do have an equity stake um, in the company as well. Um, so that could be share capital that they subscribe for, or um, more likely they'd have some kind of op option. So um, uh, an option to, 
to which they can exercise on a on a on a future sale. Um, but that's where the kind of key point comes in that with um, an EOT, um, it's not possible to say that there will definitely be a future opportunity to to sell those shares um, because the trust is the one that's in control. It would need to decide that it's in the best interest of all the employees to sell the business, which would allow the management team to sell their shares as well along alongside. Um, or in the absence of a, a future third party sale, maybe the management team could sell to the, the trust, but the trust would have to also decide that that's what it what is in the best interest of all the employees and the valuation for those shares um, would, would um, include a minority discount for um, the management to, to sell to the trust for tax purposes, which usually means it's not a very tax efficient way for management to realise their investment. So it is quite possible, um, but it's just less easy for the management team to be able to realise the, the value of their equity. Thanks, Nicola. I suppose while we're looking at some of the tax implications, um, I think you touched on, on some of them already, but do you mind giving a bit of a, a sort of, I guess, pros and cons and, and between MBO and EOT and some of the things beyond what you've talked about that uh, people need to consider? Yeah, thank you. So if we look at a, a management buyout first, then um, typically what happens there is a new company will be will be incorporated to, to buy the existing company. Um, and then the, the, the vendors, as the, the selling shareholders, will usually then receive a combination of different types of consideration for their value. So usually some cash, um, but then they might also be retaining a stake. Um, so some shares in the new, this new company, and then sometimes as well, deferred consideration of some sort in loan notes or type of, types of preferred share. Um, and there's specific tax treatments for all of those different kinds of consideration, but, um, but there's nothing really terribly special about it in terms of it's whether it's a management buyout um, as opposed to a trade sale. It's just that you often have different forms of consideration, but there are no kind of specific reliefs. Um, so they, the, the, the vendors will usually pay capital gains tax on any cash that they receive. Um, and, um, and, and then if they're obtaining shares in the new company, usually their gain will be rolled into those new shares, for example. Um, you often need tax clearances from HMRC, but there are certain anti-avoidance provisions which don't apply. Um, so um, that's usually part of the process as well for, for an MBO um, and taking advice on the potential for those anti-avoidance provisions to apply at an early stage is always advisable. Um, for the management team, the key thing for them is to ensure that there are no employment income tax charges in relation to the shares that they acquire. So some thought needs to be given to how that's structured. Um, usually the key thing there is to make sure that the values are all right and everybody's paying the right amount for their shares. Um, so that's a very broad outline of MBO. For, for an EOT, then as I've mentioned, the key sort of headline there is that the um, there's an exemption from tax from capital gains tax on the sale of the shares to the trust. Um, it's really important that the value is right. So um, and if any consideration received which is over and above the market value of those shares would normally be taxed as employment income. Um, so it's really important to get a robust valuation. Um, so um, uh, but 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 other than that 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 headline exemption is is obviously attractive. Um, now we've got a budget coming up in a, in a few weeks time, so we don't know at the moment what's going to happen to both CGT rates in general and the, and the treatment for the EOTs. So um, you know some of this may may change, of course. Um, but um, you know, the, the hope is that the, the the government will be supportive for of the EOTs and employee ownership as a whole, so that there won't be too much material change there. But but we don't know. Um, yeah, but at the at the at the moment, that's one of the kind of the, the key points about an EOT um, for the for the vendors to consider that there is this exemption from uh, CGT for their for their for their consideration. Thanks, Nicola. I think it's fair to say 
probably management buyouts and EOTs are, are more complex in terms of structuring than perhaps a, a, a trade sale. So I think getting that tax input and um, looking at that quite carefully, because if you get the structure wrong, it can lead to quite quite big tax bills that uh, nobody wants to see. So um, one of the points you, you mentioned there on the EOTs was around um, the valuation and having an independent valuation being, being absolutely critical. We, we've had a question around what is the process for establishing the valuation for a management buyout so isaac i wonder whether you could cover just just how how we might see that in practice um in, in terms of the deals we've done uh yeah sure so i think what's quite common in these scenarios ultimately is, is for an external to the valuation to be sought so um this all comes down to sort of part of the planning and preparation for process um, because you know shareholders might um, believe that they you know they want to undertake an MBO, but uh, what value is going to be a key consideration for them in, in sort of determining whether they are going to embark on on that transaction. Um, so we see um, some clients where we do what's called feasibility studies for them, um, where we look at their various different options, and part of that process can be sort of looking at an, an indicative valuation. Um, but we have another scenario is where sort of an external accountant comes in and does a more formal valuation of the business, um, sort of stepping back and, and setting that commercial valuation, which is then sort of subsequently used as as the starting point for the transaction. I think I think it's probably fair to say sometimes we do see the the yeah the the independent valuation, but ultimately we've got a buyer, we've got a seller, and so um, quite often there is negotiation around it. Partly, it might come back to whether it's a vendor-led or management-led. A vendor-led, they may set the price based on that independent valuation or whatever they perceive it to be. A management-led one, they may actually come and propose that valuation, which inherently is going to be dependent on the funding of that um, that that value. So that probably sort of traverses over to to Alison in terms of looking at how we fund that that value in a bit more detail. Yes, yeah. yeah, certainly. I, I would start with saying in all cases, um, the motivation for the transaction, whether you decide upon MBO or EOT, is imperative to any lender. We're basically backing the people um, that are going to be either be the, the management team or indeed in the case of an EOT, um, that it's going to be properly governed, there's an independent trustee, etc. that it will it is genuinely going to be operated in the interests of the employees. So um, yeah, I would say the motivation um, for undertaking the transaction, the principles, because ultimately any lender um, and is going to be dependent upon the future performance of the business and the continued performance of the business. So it's really getting underneath it that the skill set and the desire and the passion to continue that um, is what they're supporting. Sorry, just remind me again there, Matthew, what's the specific question? So I think I went off on a tangent. I guess just looking at some of the, I guess, context of, of raising debt into the into the deal you know what, what are i guess what makes a good proposal for uh funders and i suppose if you're in the context of an mbo versus an eot you know what sort of differences in appetite might we be seeing yeah okay so sorry yeah thank you so yeah first of all that rationale and then we can get down to the actual what is possible in terms of raising debt towards these transactions. Once we've established a, a healthy um, and robust rationale for either of those avenues that, that might be selected, it then comes down to the, the basically what we refer to as the debt capacity of the business. Um, it's quite, we will look to determine what we refer to as a sustainable EBITDA performance of the business. So we are looking for really steady businesses um, with good track records um, and confidence in the future performance. Um, and good, we're looking for robust um, management information systems. So uh, to Isaac's point about sort of the preparation um, for any transaction, whatever the consideration may be, is really imperative because um, as I say, for the lender to take the request seriously and then be confident once the debt is actually deployed, we really need um, fully integrated financial modelling of the business. So if that's not something that's a standard practice, you want to be start to, to integrate that into your business. 
Um, in terms of just high level for the purposes of the webinar, um, sort of rules of thumb when it comes to deploying debt for transactions, there's good appetite in the marketplace at the moment across the board. I say across the board because we are independent funding. Um, we have access to high street banks. We also access uh, challenger banks, alternative funders and private debt funds. Um, I'll just briefly um, explain what I mean by that. But a high street bank, for example, would typically look to deploy sort of two, maybe up to three times of EBITDA towards a transaction of this nature. Um, they would typically look to be repaid sort of within sort of three years um, and they would prefer to be ahead, repaid ahead of any of your deferred consideration if that was um, part of the transaction. The other lenders that are referred to, so challenger banks, private debt funds, the principles were roughly the same, but just slightly stretched parameters. For example, rather than repaying over three years, they might have appetite to re be repaid over five years, or they might have appetite to allow some deferred to be repaid ahead of them. I'm just sort of trying to talk you through, there's lots of funding options available that will um, play a role in what, ultimately what cash you can take in day one. Um, and or when you can realize your deferred consideration but it all comes down to the robustness of the financial information and indeed being confident about the sustained performance of the business thanks Alice. i think it, it you know it's, it's fair to say that when it comes to debt capacity you know for an mbo it is looking at the assets and the cash flows of the business to essentially self-fund its acquisition so um i think Clearly, there's a range of funders that, that can support those transactions, but can provide a bit of flexibility. But it comes down to, you know, once that debt's come into the business, into the group, it needs to be affordable, it needs to be sustainable, and that needs to, to sort of match up with, you know, management's plan and strategy going forward. Um, thank you, Alison. Um, so we, we've had another question around the, uh, the costs relating to... Um, a management-led process, but I think it's probably fair to, to answer the question of how, how do these uh, transactions get um, get or how do the costs get get covered? So I think particularly when it comes to um, the early stages of a of a management buyout, um, they tend to be funded by the company. So there needs to be sort of a mutual agreement between the vendors and the management team to explore some of that transaction. Um, and one of the misconceptions is that the management team are going to have to put in money personally to cover those costs. Sometimes that does happen, um, but fairly rare in my experience. Um, the majority of the, the costs associated with the transaction tend to be covered by the funding that's raised for the transaction. So in an MBO, there's a new company that's set up typically to, to make the transaction. The funding goes into that new company and that new company essentially is the buyer and pays the, the costs of the, of the deal. So not necessarily, again, the management team having to put into their pockets and, and, and pay professional costs or whatever the cost might, might be for, uh, for the transaction. OK, um, now just sort of taking, uh, I guess, a, a step forward in terms of post transaction. So if we've 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 now done the deal. Um, I wonder if we could just cover some of the areas that um, shareholders and management teams might want to think about post-transaction. Post so uh, Nicola, from an EOT perspective, you know, what after the event, what, what should people be aware of? Yeah, a couple of key things to talk about there. Um, one is the governance of the EOT, which I've mentioned already, but particularly important to to consider because it is a very different type of structure from um, a, a management buyout or a trade sale. So you have a trust which controls the, the company. Um, you need to, well, have already decided, but who the, who the trustees are gonna be. So usually there's a trust company. So the trustees are really the, the directors of the board of that trust. Um, and usually one of the original sellers will be on the board of that trust and maybe also on the board of the company but then you will have other others as well so management team um probably an independent trustee ideally on the on the employee ownership trust board as well um so the interaction between 
um, the, the board of the trusts and the board of the company and the and the vendors who will still usually be owed money from the from the trust for the um, for the value of the shares. Um, that all needs to be governed very carefully and the conflicts of interest um, managed carefully. Um, and, al and also in that as well, how you're involving the employees and, and to what extent. Um, so there's that bit to think about as well, the integration of that real kind of employee ownership ethos. Um, so that's an important part. Um, and then there's also um, the, um, uh, the incentives to think about in terms of the um, the, the bonuses for the employees um, usually um, to take advantage of tax-free bonus bonuses that you need to sort of set up a particular kind of written written document about how that's going to work. Um, so there's that to think about as well. Um, and then and then there's the transition period which we've talked about. So um, ensuring that um, uh, the the management team are equipped to take that business forward within that employee ownership ethos. Thanks, Nicola. Um, I think, uh, Isaac, in terms of an MBO after the event, what, what do we need to consider? Uh, yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, I think the first sort of consideration is, is ultimately obviously management are now shareholders of the business um, and on day one, their ordinary shares are worth a nominal value um, and ultimately the growth in their value comes from, from two main routes. Um, so the first route is through growing the, the profitability of the business. Um, so when management sort of put down their plan to to undertake an MBO, they would have uh, presented a business plan to funders and, and to the vendors and sort of post transaction. It's now time for them to sort of put the steps and actions in place to ultimately um, go about achieving that plan and, and growing the profits of the business, which in turn will, will grow its value. Um, the second part is is paying down the debt that they've utilized. To, to undertake the transaction. Uh, so that could be bank funding, um, that could be you know, vendor deferral, um, but ultimately for every pound of debt that they're repaying, they're adding a pound to their, their value moving forwards. I think that management will be entering into this with an eye on the future of a potential um, wealth creation event, and that might not come for some time. And these are sort of the two critical steps they need to take to achieve that. Um, but once they sort of repaid that debt and, and grown the value of the business, there's potential for for future transactions. That could be a trade sale, um, that could be you know selling to an employee ownership trust, um, or they could undertake a, a secondary management buyout. So you know with the next generation of management coming through, um, they will now will become the sellers in that scenario. Um, so it's sort of one eye on on that wealth creation event in the future, but sort of growing the profits and repaying the debt in the interim. Thanks, I, th I think that's that's a key point, and it's it's probably why I enjoy working on management buyouts so much. Is that it is such a transformational event for for management. It can really change their lives, going from an employee to a shareholder, and ultimately, um, you know, realise value at a future future date. Um, Ali, we've had a couple of uh, questions here around um, around around funding, so. The first one was, is there a minimum transaction value that a debt provider will want to fund an MBO? Yeah, um, it comes down to the debt capacity of the business. Um, so for, for smaller businesses, you can look through to the assets of the business. So when I say assets, properties, debtors, stock, uh, plant and machinery, etc. And there could be um, some debt that can be raised on the back of those assets. Over and above that, you can look to what I was referring to earlier as a multiple, what we refer to as cash flow debt, leverage debt, a multiple of EBITDA. It, for that type of debt, the really, the absolute de minimis EBITDA, I would say, um, is it has half a million, more comfortably probably a million pounds. And the reason for that is you need um, a healthy margin in the EBITDA performance to deploy that type of debt because even with the best forecasting will in the world, things are going to happen and we need to leave a margin of error um, so that we're not putting the business under too much pressure. So yeah, it, it, we, we could see what we could leverage on the back of the assets on the balance sheet. And then for the cash flow leverage debt, I would say half a million to a million pounds EBITDA is a sort of minimum threshold for that type of debt. Thanks, Ali. Um, and I think a, a sort of, a question now on funding the, the EOTs. Um, now, clearly, when it comes to an, an employee ownership trust, 
and it's unlikely equity will, will will be getting involved in that sort of transaction because well the owner the, the trust owns the shares and their exit could be fairly limited but um another one for you Alison you know how how would the how would the EOT get the money to 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 make the acquisition yeah and it, it sort of circles back to the point um that we made at the beginning um a combination of factors sort of typically um and the one that we're Nicola and I are working on live at the moment. There's a combination, they're taking some cash that's available in the business right now. And then there'll be uh, some senior um, bank debt put into the transaction. And then the remainder will be vendor deferred consideration, loan notes in this instance. So it's a com uh, the consideration in this case is um, the enterprise value of the business, eight million pounds. Um, and it's going to be yeah, achieved in a number of ways. Thanks, Alison. I think you know, quite often in, in these sorts of transactions, both MBOs and EOTs, there may be cash on the balance sheet of the business already. And sometimes that, you know, that can be lent up to the buyer to essentially facilitate the purchase. So that, that's another mechanism if there's, you know, there's cash available in the business to help, help fund the day, day one cash. Um, Nicola, there's a, a question here on EOTs, and the question is, is there an optimum number of staff for this to work well? There's obviously a minimum number. Um, um, there's, no, there's no minimum number as such, but in order um, for it to work, um, you will need a certain number of people to be able to take the business forward, so you need a decent management team still. Um, and then, and then um, there is a, um, a requirement called a sort of limited participation requirement that, that broadly um, there's got to be more than 40% of the people who are not vendors or related to the vendors who are employees of the business. So um, um, there, there is that requirement, but, but there, isn't, there isn't actually a, a sort of minimum number over and above that. Um, it's just that in order for the business to be successful and for um, that legacy to work for it to be held for the benefit of the employees you need a, a big enough pool of people for them to be able to to run that business going forward yeah yeah thank you and i guess there's so I said, there's no there's no maximum either we, we've seen all shapes and sizes um, when it comes to eot so um that's that's not an issue well i think um we're, we're approaching our allotted hour, so I think we, we'll, we'll round up there, but I'd just like to sort of leave some sort of final remarks and hopefully today's session has been been useful. Um, there will be a recording of this, and so please uh, feel free to get in touch with uh, Gemma, who's um, the GL on the screen that you've um, hopefully had uh, interactions with. She'll be able to share a, um, a recording of it. And hopefully it's been useful at demonstrating some of the things that need to be considered, some of the complexities around embarking on a management buyout or employee ownership trust. So um, you know, please feel free to get in touch if you'd like to explore any of those transactions. And as Isaac mentioned, we often take these sort of feasibility studies where we can um, look at the, the circumstances specifically to, to your business to see what might be appropriate and what might be achievable. Um, so. Finally, I'd like to say thank you to, to our speakers um, and thank you again to everyone who's uh, tuned in. And uh, final plug, our, ex um, our final exit options webinar on um, private equity will be in two weeks on the 17th of October. Thank you very much.